we, we ended at Magdeburg, and now we're going to look at some developments after Magdeburg or beyond Magdeburg, and then we'll get into some particular issues that I want to highlight. So th this is just uh, not comprehensive at all, just throwing out a couple other things that are important beyond Magdeburg. So later, Genesio Lutherans applied the understanding of the duty to resist to new situations. So in Magdeburg, and in all of those questions that we were talking about earlier, the primary, though not exclusive focus, was a civil ruler intruding in upon other civil rulers. Obviously, there is religious issues all wrapped up in it, but the specific question was emperor, overlord, and can the lower magistrates actually resist? That, that was the particular question. Obviously, already I've laid out uh, more of the general three estates questions, but that was the particular question at play in Magdeburg. The, the later Nicio Lutherans uh, applied this to uh, a, a, a slightly different situation uh, within Lutheran lands. So um, here's a situation that uh, Mat uh, Matthias uh, Judex uh, applied in his situation, and I'm not going to get into all those details, but Lutheran clerical resistance to Lutheran princely overreach. So before, it's Roman emperor and Lutheran uh, lesser magistrates. Now, now, now it's Lutheran Lutheran, but it's the civil government overreaching into the church. This, this increasingly became, even in Luther's later life, uh, he, he was concerned about this too, even though he did call upon the, the secular or the civil magistrates to be emergency bishops as an emergency situation. At the same time, uh, the, the, the focus started changing for him in terms of who's overreaching what, because he saw that the princes were, once they got some of this power, they didn't want to give it up. And so that became a bigger concern later in Luther's life. And we see this get played out after Magdeburg as well. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Also, in terms of the Book of Concord, uh, does, does it speak uh, to the issue of resistance? Mostly it's all implicit, but I just want to throw one factoid out there that Formula 10 on Adiaphora, right, uh, can really, and I would say should be read to implicitly support the actions of the Magdeburgers. Now, it never says that, right? It never says it explicitly. But um, they, they resisted uh, what? What were they resisting? Scandalous and enforced adiaphora. And uh, they were certainly not condemned, but they were held up theologically as the correct party. It's true. There's no explicit section that says, and they were right to resist at, you know, X, Y, and Z. However, they were considered as heroes. Uh, the Magdeburgers were, 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 the, were the huge heroes that held out the longest. So to say that this isn't in our confessions, uh, as, as some people might, might say, well, hey, where does it say it in our confessions? I, I would point to this as one response. Also, if you want to go further than that, uh, you've got John Gerhard, and he actually confirms that this becomes a plank of, of Lutheran understanding of uh, the three estates and resistance to ty tyrannical authority. He takes a stance in his, uh, how do you pronounce that? Is it Lotzi or Loki or however you pronounce it? That a tyrant who has stepped out of his office, we've heard that before, has become a private person and that self-defense against him is a law of nature. So this is not just a constitutionalist positive law argument, but actually uh, derives from natural law and self-defense. It's no surprise that Gerhard is going to take on Melanchthon's line of thinking. Isn't that how it worked so many times, where Luther will, uh, he'll, he'll, he'll kind of blaze the way, often in conjunction with Melanchthon, but it's Melanchthon who systematizes it. Luther is a very situational writer. Uh, he doesn't produce a dogmatics, so to speak. Um, but Melanchthon, he systematizes. And so on many of these issues of church and state, Melanchthon is the one who creates or organizes the language that gets picked up.
uh, by men like John Gerhardt. So uh, Richard Bennert, and I'll, I'll uh, talk about his PhD thesis a little bit later, he has this great quote when he's talking about the development of Lutheran resistance theory, and uh, they go full circle. The full circle had nearly been turned. The gospel, instead of forbidding all resistance, or even reluctantly allowing it, seems to have encouraged it to some degree, now in the minds of the Lutherans. Divine commands to resist evil could reinforce temporal and natural laws which allowed disobedience or resistance to tyrannical authorities, unjust judges, and would-be murderers and robbers. Scripture and law were now free to cooperate in defending the Reformation against antagonistic rulers. We see this in Melanchthon's political or political philosophical writings where, uh, you know, the Decalogue and natural law he sees are saying the same thing. Different degrees of clarity, of course, but we see that development in his mind, and that gets expressed in resistance theory, where the Lutherans wind up as well. Now I want to go to a couple particular issues on resistance. So the grounds of resistance, we've talked a lot about those, uh, we, uh, and, and I've kind of laid out the Lutheran case for it, but I want to make, uh, I want to highlight that the grounds for the Lutherans were, in, were different, very different from people who came before them and people who came after them. And I think we, we need to take careful note of this. Again, this is Bennett. Conspicuous by their absence from Lutheran resistance literature were references to the authority of the community. The prince's obligation to protect their subjects from the emperor's rapacity was not owed to the community, but to God, from whom came their vocation, or vocatio, to use the sword. The community of subjects played an essentially passive role in resistance, except insofar as heads of households were to protect their families, an obligation, again, deriving from their divinely established vocation. I would change the word passive to indirect because they would participate, but how? Well, the refrain I've been trying to make is within their sphere and uh, practically uh, speaking under their prince's leadership and authority. So they weren't utterly passive, but they weren't the ones to lead the charge. Why? Because they weren't the ones that actually had that vocation. That wasn't according to their station. Now, this is very different from those who would derive resistance um, uh, to, to a legitimately ordained um, uh, government official, a magistrate, from communal authority. Because this really gets to the question that Fritz was talking about in the churchly sphere, about where does the authority come from? Or who's it mediated through? And the Lutherans did not go back to saying that, well, the prince ultimately gets his authority from the community. Now, it might be mediated through electors or other things like that. They wouldn't say you can't set up some type of representative uh, aspect to government. They wouldn't say that it's forbidden, but they would not say that it's inherent to uh, paternal authority uh, and civil government being a type of paternal authority, that it's not essentially inherent to it. And this is not just in distinction or contradistinction to later reformed thinkers, or if you get even further to kind of Lockean understanding of popular sovereignty and that there's no legitimate government without the what? The consent of the governed. But there's also people during the medieval period and ancient too, who are advocates of communal authority being the basis for resistance. Um, there is conciliarist reasoning so again, to flip over to churchly matters, uh, the, the conciliarists, and uh, I, I should explain that term, those who believed, uh, there's this debate going through the Middle Ages where who has more authority? Who's higher than who? Is the pope over councils or can a council trump a pope? Now, of course, after Vatican I, that's been settled in the Roman church, uh, it's the pope. But there were a lot of conciliarists who believed that a council could trump a pope. And they, they developed a lot of their argumentation based upon that the authority of the community 
as a whole had more authority than, than the top guy, than the head. Melanchthon studiously, studiously not only avoids those arguments, but he explicitly rejects them. Now, maybe this is uh, sad news for those of you who think this would be a good way to argue. I don't know if you want to argue that way or not. I'm, you know, I'm just, you know, reporting the facts. You can decide. Um, I actually think it is good because if uh, it's very easy to start saying, uh, you know, the authority of the community is where everything uh, derives from, and, and if you don't have the consent of the governed, nothing is legitimate. Now, apply that to the family. What happens? If mom and kids say, and we're not talking about a tyrannical, monstrous situation here, but, well, we've decided to withdraw our consent. Uh, that's not how it works, right? None of us believe that. And Melanchthon makes sure that even though he makes a distinction between the father of a household and political uh, fatherhood, he understands it kind of on the same continu continuum and of the same nature, which is very interesting because Aristotle and a lot of the ancient philosophers made a much harder distinction, even though they saw some similarities between paternal authority and political authority. And in the Lutheran tradition, Luther and Melanchthon, they tie it much tighter together. It's not black and white, but they tie it much tighter than, uh, than the ancient philosophers. So um, uh, Melanchthon explicitly re rejects uh, conciliarist and alchemist uh, uh, thought uh, on these grounds. Uh, I'll give you a quote, and this is from Melanchthon's commentary on Aristotle's politics. Some, like Occam, falsely say that the consent of the people confers imperium. This is false, for princes also rule the unwilling by right, and rightfully hold imperium not merely by the consent of the people, but also through legitimate war, the oppression of criminals, and legitimate succession. So here he is, he's not just uh, in his political writings and when he's concerned about the mob, he's not just dealing with kind of the Anabaptists or the, or Munzner of the Peasants' War, but he's also in dialogue or in disagreement with earlier thinkers. However, he's also, uh, you know, uh, arguing against those who are kind of nascent popular sovereignty advocates as well. Uh, such as the folks behind the Peasants' Revolt and later Calvinist and uh, uh, Reformed folks uh, with their idea of there is a covenant and then later, I've already talked about kind of the Lockean contract theory of governance. Um, here's actually a very interesting quote from Flacius who is uh, very pro-resistance. So this isn't a, a toady of the princes that we're talking about. Uh, this is one of the arch Nicio Lutherans uh, who, who critiques Melanchthon on many points, but he and Melanchthon totally agree about uh, being scared of these reformed ideas that I would say, and you know, political uh, philosophy historians would say, lead straight to kind of uh, a mobocracy of uh, democracy. Uh, writing to Gallus concerning the situation in Antwerp, these are the opening days of kind of the Dutch Revolution, and in Antwerp you had uh, Calvinist Lutherans and Roman Catholics, and the Calvinists were increasingly wanting to uh, overthrow the government. And so here's what he said. He said, I'm very afraid that the unrest will come to pass, meaning here in Antwerp, as it had already in France. For here too, the Calvinists are infected with the spirit of rebellion. And that was the Lutheran attitude towards the Reformed more generally about their theories of governance and how quickly they were okay with churchmen leading, uh, you, you know, armed insurrections. It's very reminiscent of Zwingli. Zwingli dies where? Do you remember? On the battlefield. Now, again, I want to be very clear. I, I want to thread this, this needle I, uh, because uh, I don't want to tip back over into saying there's never a time for the church to say, yes, you need to resist this tyrannical authority, and yes, the, the proper people need to take up the sword. But that's the key distinction. Who should be taking up the sword? Each according to his station. The, the clergyman shouldn't be like Zwingli marching out. You shouldn't just say, let's all just have a big popular rebellion. This is, in some ways, 
the distinction between uh, the, the French Revolution and, as some would argue, uh, the American Revolution. Who leads the American Revolution? It's not just a popular uprising, but it's uh, state, well, colonial governments. It's much more orderly. Yes, I know that you had a, a, a lot of folks uh, who, who were more uh, sympathetic to French revolutionary ideas. And, and, and I'm, I, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. But my point is, is that the Lutherans, they wanted to understand legitimate resistance based on the three estates, each according to his station, and not these ideas of uh, popular sovereign, sovereignty uh, being necessary to confer rightful authority. So uh, I guess I've said everything I wanted to say already on this slide. So yeah, resistance in the Lutheran understanding, and I would say biblical, it's rooted in duty toward God, not uh, in some amorphous uh, authority in the community. Because where does that lead? You know, the people need this. And then you get a bigger tyrant than anyone else who speaks in the name of the people, you know? Distinction between resistance and rebellion is huge in, in, the, in our Lutheran understanding. And I would also point to the fact that they talk about duty and obligation far more than rights. Now, I don't want to totally reject the language of rights and overreact, because there's a good way to understand it, but if it's unlinked with duty, then you get into huge problems. So they will talk about a right to defend yourself and your home or your homeland even, but that's linked to obligations that God has given you. Um, for Melanchthon, natural law then is, uh, cons cons I can't even pronounce the word right now. <laughs> yeah, constitutive, of political authority and limits its legitimate exercise. Because I think a lot of people that want to wrest the, the right to resist, it has to be rooted in kind of like some inherent human rights, you know, like if we're all part of the UN or something like that. But uh, because they're scared that if you don't root it there in individual rights, then you're not going to be able to resist tyranny. But that's, that, that's not how Melanchthon sees it, nor Luther, nor any of the Lutherans. Natural law, yes, it constitutes political authority. It confers this authority. And sometimes the consent of the governed or those under the authority, yeah, well, it doesn't matter, right? So this is St. Paul. Slaves, what? Obey your masters. Wife, children, obey the head of your household. Okay, we've talked a lot about exceptions, right? And those are legitimate. But here's the point. Why can there be exceptions? Well, it's not because of some inherent human right or something like that, but rather that God's institution and natural law itself not only constitutes political authority, but also it in and of itself limits it, which this is a much better system because God himself has limited it. You don't have to worry about well, what if the people decide we want a totalitarian government? I mean, that would never happen, would it? <laughs> it would happen. I would much rather trust in God and his three estates and his institutions and how he constitute things than trusting in the quote-unquote amorphous will of the people. Again, the Lutherans were very, very solid, and I would say on very firm footing, what, what's, what, what's worse, the tyrant or the mob? Well, they didn't want either, but the mob's worse. A tyrant's really bad, but what you want is good, orderly governance through the three hierarchies. Again, each according to his station. So I want to bring up very, very you know, in, in conjunction with that, the issue of equality. Uh, many ancient, medieval, and a, a, a lot of later uh, lock-in, just to use kind of... It, to, to label it broadly, what do they think the defining aspect of humanity is? Equality. I mean, isn't that in some of our founding documents? Right? All men are created equal. Now, wh while there may be a good and salutary way to understand that, let's think about this. Uh, there, there's different things that the scriptures say about human beings, about mankind. And so, in the order of redemption, are we all equally saved? Are we all equally 
loved. Yes, this is why Paul talks about there's neither Jew nor Greek, um, slave or free, male and female. And yet, the defining aspect uh, of mankind in the created order, or the order of creation, is not equality, it's the opposite. It's actually inequality, because it starts out with a distinction. Because when God creates man, what does he do? He makes man and woman. So by definition, the different offices and orders and how humanity is actually created is based upon distinction. Yes, there is mutuality and equality of sorts, but Melanchthon uh, and Luther, contrary to the utopianism, uh, the, uh, in other words, the Schwermgeister eye of Romanism, because you had these uh, monastic ideals, right? And, and, and kind of back before the fall, uh, what, what did you have? A community of property and all these things. Melanchthon's saying, no, the bedrock of the created order is not some utopia of everyone's equal and there's no hierarchy, but actually hierarchy is built into the cake, and that's actually good. So, contra the utopianism of Romanism and the radicals, Lutheran he Lutherans held that the defining truth of the creator was inequality, not equality. Here's Brenz. Therefore, secular government is a distinct entity, entirely separate from Christian government. For in the Christian realm, all believers are equal and possess all goods equally in Christ. But in the secular realm, goods cannot be distributed equally, and so they cannot be possessed equally. Even if everything were to be distributed equally, that equality would not last 10 minutes. Similarly, individuals cannot be equal, for the nature of this realm is that one person must be a ruler or a magistrate, while the other is a subject. One must be a master, the other servant. Just as in this world, individuals cannot be uniform in quantity or quality. One is tall, the other short. One is black, the other white. Thus also, one is master, the other subject. And this sounds exactly like C.F.W. Walther when he gives those wonderful lectures on socialism and communism in his congregations or that tri-congregation in St. Louis. Um, if you haven't read those, those are translated in English and they're, 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 they're wonderful. They're excellent. Okay, so we've been talking a lot about resisting. I want to show uh, the folks here, I know many of you have read it already, what my circuit wrote when we were slapped with that mask order I was speaking of earlier. And I, and, and I wanted to show you this more towards the end because I, I think that now that we've walked through the history, we've walked through the three estates, we've talked about burden of proof, you will see how all of this came out in what we produced. Concerning civil government ordering masks in church, we cannot in good conscience refuse to allow a Christian to come to church services because he's not wearing a mask. We are not lawless rebels, nor deny that civil government indeed has appropriate interest and authority in matters pertaining to public health and safety. However, the authority of the civil government is not absolute. We do not recognize the civil government's authority to order our churches to require masks. So notice what kind of orders are we rejecting? Illegal or illegitimate? Illegitimate, yeah illegitimate. The coronavirus situation is not so severe as to warrant such an intrusion into the affairs of the church, especially as the intrusion pertains to worship. So again, the problem is, is that, yeah, you've got some legitimate interest in this, but now you're stepping into our sphere, claiming an exception and failing to meet what? The burden of proof. <clears throat> Point two, we cannot categorically nor generally consider it a sin for a Christian to come to church without a mask. Now we're speaking uh, to our own people as well. This is not only in reference to recognized exceptional circumstances due to health or other reasons, but against the orders of the civil government. Point A, a Christian may come to a church service without a mask with a clear conscience, recognizing that the government is illegitimately intruding into the church's affairs, as explained in the first point. B, it is inappropriate for Christians to claim or imply that not wearing a mask is necessarily violating the law of love. There may, and that's why we put necessarily, there may be times, you know, there may be times where you say, yes, I'm going to go visit somebody who's 
aged or sick or whatnot, uh, a, a weak constitution. And even though you know those, those little cloth masks don't do much, I'm gonna wear it. Not just because the hospital tells me to, because it might decrease the chances of passing something on slightly, and, it, and, it, and it's worth that. So, but you remember what people were saying. You aren't loving your neighbor, right? If you don't wear a mask, you don't love your neighbor. And, uh, oh yeah, there are different goods, goals, and circumstances that Christians will need to weigh out. So you see the particularity coming in here, the casuistry, and how best to love their neighbor in this, and every other matter. While the safety of our neighbors in regards to earthly health is an important good, it is not the sole good to be considered. Concerns regarding the normal worship life of the congregation, the spiritual and earthly health that is damaged by the isolation that comes from overzealous safety precautions, and the potential and seemingly likely further intrusions by the civil government into the life of the church are all goods that ought to be considered by Christians. Again, people want to myopically think about one thing and then tell us exactly how we must love our neighbor. Now, sometimes you can't do that, right? <laughs> you know, should I steal or not? Well, you should not steal. This is not loving your neighbor. But most of the time, it's what? You're weighing out a whole bunch of things. I think, uh, Eckert, you had a, a, a blog post about don't tell me how to love my neighbor. It was something along those lines. I don't remember the exact title, but that was very similar to this. Faithful Christians may come to different conclusions on how to best th love their neighbor in this matter, depending on their circumstances and how they carefully weigh out various concerns. And then the third point. While we as pastors are most focused upon the life of the church, the scriptures have much to say about civil government, marriage and family, and the relationship between the three estates. We cannot definitively say that it is a sin for a Christian citizen not to follow orders concerning masks under present circumstances. Now, now we're moving to we as the church, as Luther says, we are to what? Not just to preach to Christians as Christians, but Christians who what? Live in the world. And we, they need instruction. And also to preach sometimes uh, needfully against the, the, the government as well. So point A, there are good reasons for a citizen to think that these orders are an unnecessary, illegitimate, and gross overreach of the civil government's authority that will intrude upon and harm familial life. So not, we're not just saying you're allowed to come to church, but also you as a Christian may and should have your conscience formed to understand that, hey, how should I view this? Uh, sh should, should I actually never visit my neighbors? Because there are lots of rules about that stuff too. Don't get together for Christmas or Thanksgiving. Don't do that. Don't do this. So it wasn't enough, I, uh, we believed anyway, to just speak to you may come to church. But also, how should you think about this in your familial life? Familial life, including social, economic, and other aspects of earthly life. There are also good reasons to believe in many jurisdictions that these orders are in violation of the clear meaning and intent of the laws of the civil government itself. And there we just note that some of these orders were against the positive law, the express law. And in Wisconsin, uh, not only was that true in fact, but it was, uh, you know, our, our Wisconsin Supreme Court concurred with it, uh, with, with some of these orders. Some of the pertinent passages of Scripture in relation to this issue are Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, Matthew 22, Romans 13, all the say is doctrina, um, Exodus 1, Shifra and Pua, Acts 5, 1 Samuel, um, the whole complex stuff with Saul, Jonathan, and David, 1 Samuel 25, Nabal and Abigail, Acts 25, Paul appealing to Caesar as his right was as a Roman citizen. I remember Fritz seeing this, and you were the one who uh, originally alerted me to 1 Samuel 14 with how the people ransom Jonathan and defend him. You don't remember. Well, I'll take credit for this from now on and, and not give it to you. But it was interesting because you said that, um, and then I was digging more into this, and I found it in, I mean, the Lutherans would refer to this incident. So you must have been reading the same stuff I was, the Bible. <laughs> so. I, I think this is a good segue into authority of the home. We've been focused a lot on civil government against civil government, 
um, civil government intruding into the church. Um, but what kind of gets short shrift is what shall we think about as fathers and mothers? And, and what shall we do? Where do we draw the lines when it comes to authority in the home? Uh, I will admit that I'm, I'm not going to go into huge detail. We don't have time. Uh, but at the same time, I want to throw a few things out to help get the conversation going, because this is an understudied and underthought about aspect of resistance. Because, I would say, we're so focused on two kingdoms. And in two kingdoms, what's often left out is the home. Even though it includes it, I know, but usually it's church-state, church-state. But what about the home? Uh, G.K. Chesterton, I like this quote, without the family, we are helpless before the state. And the home also has to resist totalitarianism. Not just the church, not just pastors, not just hearers of the word, Christians as Christians, but also fathers, mothers, sons, daughter, etc. Particularity and the nations. Now, I don't want to go on and on and on about particularity. We've talked about that a lot already. But here's a few important points that we should be thinking about when we're thinking about in the home versus the civil government. Because you're not just a, a random home somewhere in some random nation. You belong to a particular people. And so many things are going to play into it when we think about this. So um, Luther reflects a great sensitivity uh, to particularity concerning his own Germans, as he calls them, right? There's this whole big debate going on throughout the Holy Roman Empire of whether you should adopt Roman law or keep the old Germanic laws. I don't want to get into it, but just demonstrate that he's very sensitive to the particularity of the nations and how different nations have different characteristics. So some distinctions to keep in mind uh, when thinking about familial versus civil authority. Um, particular history and traditions. I mean, you try to take a people who have no history of, uh, you know, a lot of self-governance and are used to what we would consider almost totalitarianism, and you try to jam them into a different system, it probably isn't going to work out so well. On the flip side, if you take a people who are used to a lot of independence and you try to uh, flip-flop them, they're probably not going to take it very well either. So again, history and tradition matters. Particularity matters. Let me give you a, a flesh and blood example. Consider the Chinese. They have always had a type of imperial government over them. Uh, in terms of obeying the government, they're much quicker to do it. Now, I'm generalizing, but compare the Chinese and what they're used to and what their traditions are as compared to, like, the Scots, uh, you know, in Scotland or the Scotch-Irish here in Appalachia. I mean, you're not going to rule them the same way you're going to rule the Chinese. It's just not going to work out. The character and the history and the traditions of those two peoples are very different. And so the relationship between the home and where the lines are drawn between home authority and governmental authority is, is, is going to be different from place to place, just like you're going to treat different uh, parcels of your farm in different ways, just because of the different types of soil and crops and other things like that. So that's number one and kind of number three, two. Uh, Luther used to always uh, kind of rip on stubborn peoples and, you know, he'd slam his beloved Germans, you know, maybe we need harsher laws because the Germans are so stubborn and, you know, they're wild and crazy. Um, and then it's interesting because people can change too. Because after the catechisms, I'm going to give credit to the catechisms. Now you think of uh, Germans, I don't mean like super recent modern Germans, but you think about Germans after the catechisms, what are they? Very orderly, very disciplined, very precise. That's not how Luther saw his Germans, because they, they were different back then. So people can change as well. Anyway, number two, the positive law of a nation. That's going to affect how those two spheres interact. Also, matters get very, very, uh, or much more complex when you uh, take into account that a nation uh, has uh, foreigners sometimes, right? inside of uh, the, the, the nation in terms of those who are descended from a common ancestor. So uh, think about this in Israel. So a lot of people will talk about the sin of partiality, which uh, it gets 
misapplied in these cases because they forget about ancient Israel where it wasn't that every single individual who lived in Israel had all the same rights and privileges. Obviously, there's certain basic things. You don't get to uh, be a, a, a jerk to someone just because they're a foreigner, not of the native land. But guess, I mean, you guys probably know, what could foreigners not do in Israel? There's a whole host of things they could not. What's that? Well, unless you were a slave and then you were part of the household. So you could be incorporated in. But you couldn't, you couldn't own land. You could own, uh, like when we think of land, we think of any size of a land. I'm, I'm talking about farmland, right? You know Why? Because that was cut up and divided and as an inheritance to those tribes and clans and families. And so you could own like an apartment or a house inside of the town or village as a sojourner, you know, a, 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 a legal inhabitant who's been allowed in. But you couldn't buy up farmland. Couldn't do it. So there's a distinction there. And then there's all these other complicated factors. Um, uh, rule by foreigners. That's going to mean that there's going to be a different relationship between the home and the state, so to speak. Also, uh, some peoples get subjugated. So you have to consider enslavement versus sometimes we'll say free peoples, right? Germans would always say that. You know, we're not slaves like the people inside the Roman Empire, but we're a free people. And empire versus government that truly encompasses a, generally speaking, unified and cohesive people. Again, I just want to throw that stuff out. Melanchthon talks about how uh, the love of fatherland is very important. And here's a summary of his, and I think it fits in with everything that I was just saying. And it fits in with resistance, as you'll see. Here's from his preface to an edition of Tacitus's Germania. Love of fatherland was inscribed on the human heart by God to instigate defense of religion and the laws of the fatherland. And that fatherland had to be understood as the community enforcing true doctrine and just laws. Amor, Melanchthon held, was thus a passion not only capable of influencing and directing the human will, as unfortunately other passions were too, but of doing that in ways and for causes pleasing to God. Similarly, the desire to know about the antiquities of the fatherland was also regarded a passion strengthening our love for fatherland and thus our will to defend it. Melanchthon thus encouraged the reading of books that tell us about the history of the fatherland and provide examples for virtuous behavior. These examples would stir love of fatherland, which in turn would in influence the will, rendering people unwilling to endure servitude, making them hostile to cruelty and tyranny. And so here we see Melanchthon talking about the community, you know, and how you should love your nation, love your people, love where you've been planted and placed and been birthed from your mother by God, and how that's going to help you understand these lines and resistance. Okay, uh, one last wonderful quote about particularity versus globalism. Uh, Pierre Trudeau, who's the legal father of Justin Trudeau, Prime Minister of Canada, said back in 1962, the road to progress lies through international integration. Nationalism will have to be abandoned as a rustic and clumsy tool. So he, he, he's, this is globalism. Solzhenitsyn, who I butchered his name, he writes, the disappearance of nations would impoverish us no less than if all peoples were made alike, with one character, one face. Nations are the wealth of mankind. They are its generalized personalities. The smallest of them has its own particular colors and embodies a particular facet of God's design. So I know this was a long kind of excursus on different national characters and histories and traditions, but you can't start thinking about the distinction between home and the civil government and the proper relationship if you take all that into account. If you're just an ideologue who says, well, here's the ideal system, and let's jam it on top of a real world situation. It does not work. Does that work when you, when you uh, are called to a congregation? Nope. It certainly doesn't. You got to know the history. You got to know the people. You got to know what is in the Constitution, right? Sometimes you actually even have to know synod bylaws and stuff like that. Now I'm going to throw some stuff out there. Uh, so one thing that when we think about the lines, we should understand that the, uh, the fundamentally best word to start thinking about 
the distinction between home and the civil government, where to draw those lines, is a recognition that they're all on this continuum of patriarchy. So it's going to be harder to draw that line than between the home and the church and the civil government and the church. It's going to be trickier. There's a sliding scale between home and nation. Nations are derivative, so there's your word, derived, uh, both biologically and historically from families. Distinction and relationship is important between paternal authority and civil authority, but we are not to understand the household in terms of the civil government. That's the totalitarian thing, right? You know, we grant you your rights. Now, that's an American way of saying it. What? It takes a village. It takes a village. That, that's actually kind of true, though, right? It is true to a certain extent. But um, not how she meant it. But, uh, <laughs> but, but it, 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 is, it, it is important for us to understand it's not, uh, again, this is an American way of saying it, but that doesn't make it wrong. But it's not that the government grants us our rights, but it recognizes those inherent, inalienable rights, even if maybe some of them aren't so inalienable. But either way, the point being is, is that rather the civil government should be un understood in terms of the family. And that's why patriarchy is helpful. And why I would assert that, and I'm not, or, this is not an original thought, I think it's obvious, but I want to say it explicitly, that the father and a mother to a lesser extent, but the father first and foremost, should be recognized as a lesser magistrate of a type, you know, of a type. So um, why, why, why can I say these things about patriarchy? Because it's assumed in the scriptures. It's defended and it's promoted. Uh, Exodus 22, Leviticus 20 is good to uh, look at this with. Uh, the father can refuse to give his daughter in marriage, right? We would draw a line there, wouldn't we? What if the government said, you must allow, we are going to take your children and marry them off as we see fit? No, no, you're not. I will resist you to the very end if you try that. Not because I despise civil authority. It's illegitimate. That's outside. Yes, does the government have an interest in marriage? Absolutely. Uh, is it wrong to have laws about marriage? No. But you... but. But again, with fuzzy lines, I might not know exactly whether the shore is rock solid earth or whether it's the ocean, but I know when we're 30 paces past the line. And if the government comes and says, you, your, your daughter, we're taking her and marrying her to somebody's son. No, that's way over the line. Now, different nations are going to have different lines of where the regulation of the home and the state. Uh, you, you go back all the way to uh, tribes and clans. Uh, the, you know, basically it's all done in the home. The, the state has very little to do with it. The Daughters of Zelophehad actually confirms and uh, promotes patriarchy because why are they inheriting land? It's not just because, hey, since Zelophehad had, had no sons, I guess women can inherit. They're not inheriting in and of themselves, but actually why? Anybody remember? Fabritius, you are quizzing us. We can quiz you now. What do they appeal? They appeal so that our father's name will not be lost. Yeah. They are inheriting kind of, you know, in personae patri, if that's the right Latin, and for the sake of their future sons. Yeah, yeah, husbands, but yeah, yeah, husbands and sons, yeah. And also, uh, now we're getting into it, whether, whether we like it or not, I guess. But also, if you, if you actually go and read Numbers 36, which many people forget to do, this comes up again because the rest of their clan come and say, they should not be allowed to marry people outside of our tribe, lest other tribes get some of our land. And so the civil government says, Moses, right, says, you must marry who? Someone according to your father's clan. So that's an interesting case of these lines. Uh, again, I, I, we're not going to read all this, but uh, there's this very interesting, uh, all this stuff that runs through the scriptures about prerogatives of the king, and we should not be like, I would say, the majority of the reformed who just think, you know, oh, the kingship was bad. Israel was bad to want a, want a king. 
Well, let's be careful here. They were bad to want a king because of why they wanted the king. Yeah, to be like other nations and because they were rejecting the Lord. And he's going to what? He's going to save us from bad stuff and do all, <laughs> do all these things. But remember, back in Deuteronomy 17 and back in Genesis 49, there was always going to be a king. God makes that very clear. And not just Christ at the end, right? But Judah is going to rule. That's fulfilled in David and the Davidic line. So anyway, oh, yeah. Um, so yeah, the king can conscript uh, uh, in, in terms of male citizens for just wars. But once we get to forced labor, that's another interesting question. I, I, I got to say, I'm, I'm a little sympathetic to saying that, yes, the civil government may in certain circumstances, not in an imperial situation, but when you actually have a cohesive people, to actually say, no, you need to give some labor. But how and when should be a mutually agreed thing upon from the households and also the civil government? Because who conscripts the Israelites, actually? The most famous example. Now, that's an imperial situation, or uh, an enslavement. Solomon, for the temple. That's actually when Israel is doing lots and lots of uh, labor. But that's not a positive uh, example with Solomon. You think it is? I, I mean, th that's my question. How positive is it? I mean, the folks uh, in the next generation or the folks that remember it, this is why they actually rebel and, and say no. So, but I, I'm just throwing it out there. We got to think about it. Like, like, so conscription to the army for men in a cohesive nation for a just war, I think that's a duty. You're a man of the community. It's, a, it's understood. You have to go fight. But, um, and, and your sons of military age. I think that's fine. However, women, as we've talked about recently in the Missouri Synod, no. That's where I'll draw the line. And again, uh, you'll have to take the last drop of blood out of my veins to, to get to my daughters. Because why? While you might uh, have a legitimate claim on me and my sons of military age, my daughters are under my authority. Even, of course, you've got the more important thing is that it's ugly for a woman to go fight, except in self-defense. And that's a necessity. That's not conscripting them for war. But there's another place where I think there's a hard line. There's a very hard line there. Um, and forced labor is another fuzzy one. I just wanted to throw it out. Uh, violence. The violence takes for granted that the civil government does not have and is not given a monopoly on violence. Self-defense is taken for granted as a natural duty. Exodus 22 talks about if you kill a man breaking into your house, you're not guilty. Fathers and mothers administer punishment to those in their household. There's a whole bunch of Bible verses for you. Household relatives have the duty to avenge members who have been maliciously injured or murdered. Deuteronomy 19, cities of refuge. And what are those men called who go to deal with murderers? Avengers of blood. Hey, but wait, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. And we say, well, civil government can do that. Yeah, but so can the clan as well. Members of the household who are acting as fathers. Uh, there, there's a lot of other things. Abraham conducts war. Tribal fathers assemble to protect their own. Um, Atalia. Uh, you brought up Atalia. I want to bring up Atalia, too. Um, she usurps, and she is the daughter. I don't know if you... If you if you know that. Yeah. Mrs. Bean went back and found it. Yeah. She's, she's uh, Ahab's daughter. Ahab and Jezebel's daughter. Now, I, I'm not, I don't want to go through the whole story, but as uh, Fabritius was saying, finally the high priest says, okay, it's time. But who does he do this in conjunction with and with the concurrence of? Because these estates have to help the civil estates. So he gathers up religious leaders. He gathers up uh, the Levites, uh, you, you know, and, and others, and so, so that they legitimize this. This is one estate helping another estate. He gathers up lesser magistrates. And they went about through Judah and gathered the Levites from all the cities of Judah and the heads of fathers' houses of Israel. So the estate of the home comes to help too, because fathers are lesser magistrates. Education, I just want to say one brief thing about education I think we all misread Luther when he says, force the kids to go to school, right? We get a little, whoa, that's really a parental thing. But what circumstance is he writing in? In an era 
in the Reformation era when, who, I mean, who was running all the schools? The church. And now the monasteries are gone, mostly. And the monks and the nuns are freed, mostly. And the schools in some regions of Germany were down to like 10% of what it used to be. This is not a normal situation. He's not giving general advice. I mean, he is, but his insistence is based on the real and present danger that German society is going to fall apart in places if we don't train up what? Lawyers and doctors and governmental officials and all these things. And so I, we can't read all of these statements as if he's saying we need a totalitarian understanding of kids have to be forced into school. Luther is talking about a very particular emergency situation. We've already talked about engagement and marriage. I, uh, I will just make one note. Early in his career, Luther opposed the Roman church's usurpation of authority of parents concerning secret marriages, right? The Roman church would marry people who were secretly engaged against their parents' uh, you, you know, permission. And, and so Luther said, no, that should not be tolerated, and secret betrothals don't count. You don't enter into the state of marriage except, marriage except with the consent of your father in particular. So he's pushing against the Roman church early in his career, but then later he winds up resisting the civil government because they're usurping pastoral authority concerning marital affairs. So he's, he's defending the home and the church against intrusion as well. So again, I, I, I think that's another place that we need to think more deeply about. I know I'm out of time, right? Or actually, we got, what, 15, 20 minutes? Hey, yeah, we're moving fast, great. Further resources, obviously the small catechism, but also the large. Even those of you pastors who have sworn to uphold the large catechism and you've read it, maybe even taught classes on it, read it again with this stuff in your mind, especially on the fourth commandment. Luther's 1539 disputation on the three hierarchies allegedly is coming out this summer. It was supposed to come out last summer, but this is the first time it's been translated into English. It was translated into German. Uh, I mean, it's originally in Latin. It was in, translated into German back in like 1941, I want to say. Uh, but now it's going to be in English. Praise be to God. Melanchthon's von der Notwehr Unterricht, Instruction Concerning Self-Defense. That's a very, very important work. We didn't even know Melanchthon wrote it until much later. There's an interesting textual history there. Many of us wrote it originally, and Melanchthon, and it went out in one edition, and Melanchthon said, you didn't do this very well. And so he rewrote it, but just it kept on getting reissued under Menius's name. So not until the last century did we even know it was Melanchthon. So it's, it, it's really interesting. But that is uh, only in German. So you've got you, you, you to gotta know your German. If you're interested more in that, though, I do have an article or two in English about it. The Magdeburg Confession, if you don't own it, you should. Uh, uh, not just pastors, but laymen, too. Easy to get on Amazon. Also, you can get this PhD thesis online for free. And if you can't find it, shoot me an email. I'll get it to you. Inferior magistrates in 16th century political and legal thought. Back in, I think it was 1967, uh, Richard Bennert uh, wrote this thesis. And uh, he provides tons of detail on all the complicated interplay between the jurists and the theologians and the princes. That's kind of a deep dive but it's incredibly fascinating. And he also doesn't just stop there. I've just kind of dipped our toes into the later Reformed thought, but he goes through Calvin and Bullinger and Beza, and then he goes all the way to the, to the English thought too. It's a fascinating document. Last but not least, if you want a good uh, article summary of the three phases of Lutheran resistance theory, particularly focused on Luther himself, Luther and the Right of Resistance to the Emperor in Studies in the Reformation, Luther to Hooker by uh, W.D.J. Cargill Thompson. Uh, that's not available online as far as I'm aware, but um, I know at least St. Louis has a copy, Fort Wayne May. Um, pastors, you guys can get it by requesting it from the SEM. Layman, if you would like a copy, I would say talk to your pastor about getting a copy of that. A couple other resources. Um, Pastor Broughton and I did a three-part episode, and it's like mega long. <laughs> uh, it's uh, four and a half hours of content, and we do kind of take our time and meander and 
and whatnot. But it's on resisting the government, and it's uh, and and in some places, I think we went a lot more further into depth than what I did today on particular aspects. I think to, uh, yesterday I went more in depth on the historical development of the Wittenbergers. But Broughton and I went way more in depth on the Magdeburg Confession, and we kind of parceled out who was going to uh, go into depth on what part. So we walked through Magdeburg, not incredibly in detail, but, but more carefully. So if you're interested in this, I'd, I'd encourage you to take a listen. We also went through more biblical accounts than I've covered that should shape our thinking on this matter. Last but not least, uh, there's a page on resistance to tyrannical authority on the Bugenhagen Conference website. And I would encourage you to check that out. And also, pastors, if you haven't come to the pastors' conference, the Bugenhagen Conference, I would encourage you to do so. Um, it's a really, I think, edifying conference. And uh, we've got three great keynote speakers next year. One of them is uh, Pastor David Peterson, and the other two are Pastor Heath Curtis and uh, Pastor Ryan Leslie. Um, in conclusion, consider your station according to the Ten Commandments. With both those eyes, with that binocular vision, consider your station according to the Ten Commandments and thus have a 3D image, an imaging system as well, with that framework of the three estates, knowing what God's word is so that you can appreciate the particular challenges, the particular circumstances, so that you know what you can particularly do according to the three hierarchies, living in the two kingdoms, but under one Lord. Read Psalm 82 and then go read Luther's commentary on it. It has a magnificent ending where he talks about how God comes and sits among the gods, and those are civil rulers, not pagan deities. And he calls them gods because he has conferred upon them authority and dignity, according to his own name, to rule over people, according to his word. But at the end, he calls them sons of men because they failed, and he's going to come and cast them down, which he's going to do at the end. And that's the wonderful thing. We'll have our perfect father, our perfect king, and our perfect high priest at the end. So that's the end of the presentation, and we've got some minutes for questions. So any questions? Thanks very much for your presentation. Uh, excellent stuff, really. Um, my question is um, wondering about, so in America, it seems as though, and maybe I have a hard time when like members bring up things of how to respond. Um, so it seems like there is, going back to your distinction between Lutherans and Calvinists, it seems like there is a predominantly Calvinist view of American government that we the people give our consent to those whom we elect and they work for us and we can, you know, and then we have the power because the gov we are the government. And, and if I could interrupt you just for a moment, I just want to highlight that the Lutherans never say that this is not allowed if a people wish to organize themselves in that way. But it's not necessary uh, either. It's an adiaphron, right? <laughs> right. So um, is there, it's, it would seem like there is uh, maybe a good way to understand we the people if you view the agency of the civil government through the agency of the home rather than the opposite, which seems to be kind of the... But even there, Melanchthon is making it very clear that you can't, again, even say that necessarily because there's other legitimate ways that uh, imperium, authority, is gained. And it's not always by the consent of even the House Fathers. You see what I mean? So, but again, I think that we the people can be understood rightly if you run it through the three hierarchies. And again, what much firmer grounding do we have to say to our people, yes, uh, we should obey and honor the government according to the fourth commandment. And yet, because that has been established by God itself, they, when they cross certain lines, I, not as just a sovereign citizen 
basing my theory upon a particular form or type of government, but I as a father, I as a mother, I as a Christian will only render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. And I will render to God what is God's. And I will render to myself as the father what should be rendered unto me and render this to my clan or my tribe or, you know, anything in between. I, I don't know if that answers the question. But so, I mean, again, I think a lot of more particularly American language can be used very well as long as we are running it through the three hierarchies. Even though you're right, I mean, our founding was wrapped up in Calvinism. But again, if, if you actually look at the American Revolution, it's called now, but back then it was called the cause. Who led it? It was the aristocrats. Not all of them, of course, but many of them. And yes, the common man was called upon, but who were they led by? They were led by colonial governments. It wasn't just a mob attack. Now, there was some, uh, who's the guy who wrote all the letters? Thomas Paine. That guy had the spirit of rebellion. <laughs> you know, he said some true things, but also, uh, he was fine with the French Revolution. I think the American Revolution, we got to be careful with. It's, it, there's a lot of good, but there's a lot of not so good. Okay, you'll have time to formulate and ask further questions at the panel discussion. I get to formulate and ask further questions? We all will. Oh, okay. So we'll do that, continue that after lunch, but thank you so much for your presentation. Oh.